Bees pollinate a third of the world's food, but they're dying from colony collapse and diseases at an alarming rate. As scientists search for solutions, there's a buzz around Niue, an isolated island nation in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Beekeepers have discovered abandoned hives there, free of problems plaguing global agriculture. 99% of beekeepers in the world would cry to see these beaky bees like this, you know, they, they'd be envious of the beautiful hives like this just ticking along. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we ask if one of the smallest countries can save the world's bees. Across every corner of rural New Zealand, hives dot the landscape. Bees feed on the white flowers of a native bush to produce a national icon, Manuka honey. From honey production to pollination, bees are big business, worth $3 billion to the New Zealand economy every year. Right now, Coromandel is a big area for beekeeping because the Manuka honey is uh, very well known worldwide uh, for its therapeutic properties and uh, it's a really special place to keep bees as well. Oksana Borowick is a beekeeper and scientist who moved from Canada to the Coromandel Peninsula seven years ago. What is it that you love about beekeeping? I love beekeeping because uh, you learn something new every day. There's always something interesting happening in the hive. New Zealand's north coast sure is rugged. You have to traverse goat tracks to get to her hives. Got a bit of a confession to make. I've never been stung by a bee before. And even with all this protection, a jumper and a long sleeve shirt, I'm still a little bit nervous. The first hive we see shows drones and workers as busy as well, bees. Oh, oh there you can even see the queen. Isn't that lucky? Oh, wow. She lays all the eggs, so she's very important. Without a queen, there's no hive. We've got about 60,000 bees in the hive, and uh, they're bringing in the nectar and the pollen, and um, they're, you can just tell they're doing well. But recently, she made a discovery that sent shockwaves through a nation that protects its food bowl with strict quarantine. Um, last year, um, the hives just collapsed. The bees disappeared and all that was left behind was a queen and a few hundred bees. And it was pretty devastating because it happened so quickly over such a short period of time. And there were no dead bees in the hive, no dead bees outside. They just completely disappeared. Since the mystery mass exodus, government researchers are monitoring 20 of Oksana's hives. Already, bees in two hives have vanished. Yeah, this hive collapsed a, a few weeks ago. Um, it collapsed from several frames of brood uh, down to a queen and just a handful of bees. So, and this happened in 24 hours? Or? No, no, over um, several weeks. Other local beekeepers suffered worse losses, costing the industry millions of dollars. So I think we lost about 60-65% of our production. If you had losses like that every year, you just can't keep beekeeping. It's unsustainable. From cities to rural areas, the government is surveying their beekeepers to work out why bees are disappearing. Recently, Oksana spoke at a town hall meeting with beekeepers from around the region. When we asked how many beekeepers in the room had the same problem, a hundred of them put up their hands. And when we asked, well, who had reported it, only one hand was left standing. I guess it must be embarrassing to say you've lost hives, but um, it's not going to help cure uh, the problem if people don't report it. Mm. 
Disappearing bees isn't just devastating for New Zealand. Oksana says without bees, world food prices will skyrocket because they are so integral to agriculture production. So if uh, bees weren't around, I think one third of the food that you see on your plate wouldn't be there. Everything in, in agriculture relates back to pollination and honeybees, uh, the kiwi fruit, uh, the blueberries. Uh, most of the crops here in New Zealand are pollinated by bees. And it looks like Oksana's bees need help. A third hive appears to be collapsing. Well, we, we, it's acting suspiciously. They're shimmering. They're, they're acting differently on the comb. It, um, the bees are forging at much too early an age, which is not a sign of a healthy hive. Scientists are trying to track Oksana's hives by marking them with different shades of nail polish based on their age. Dr. Mark Goodwin is studying them for New Zealand's Plant and Food Agency. Today, the bee expert is preparing to send a new batch to her. The bees might look dead, but fresh from a short time in the fridge, they're just asleep. So we mark every week 2,000 with different colours. Um, it will be interesting to see if any of these bees turn up in anybody else's hives now, to see whether all the bees that have collapsed have just gone up there and died somewhere in the long grass, or whether they've actually drifted um, into other neighbouring colonies. And how many colours are you monitoring I, at I, one time? I, th I think we've got about 10 or 12 different colours. We're a little bit limited by the um, people who make nail polish <laughs> <laughs> to give us the colour range. The results aren't looking good. Mark is seeing the same symptoms in Oksana's hives as was found last year. They're suffering from a gut parasite which are making them age quicker. But if we're going to see the second year, then there's a chance that this is an ongoing problem and it's more, crucial, more and more crucial we have to find a solution to it. We can't just leave it alone and hope that everything's going to turn back to normal the way it was. Mark believes New Zealand is the latest nation stung by a syndrome called colony collapse disorder. More than 12 million beehives have been wiped out from Europe to America, threatening our markets and diets. We pride ourselves on this, on this big patch of ocean around us so to protect us. The colony collapse disorder we saw last year was just out of the blue. There was no hint that, that anything was going to happen. Until we find the cause, it's very hard to offer solutions to beekeepers. But it seems there is one place bees are protected by that big patch of water. Niue, a tiny island in the vast Pacific Ocean. One of the world's smallest countries, Niue is home to just 1,200 people. And it may just hold the solution to the world's bee colony collapse disaster. I've travelled here to find a beekeeper they call the Honey Man. Excellent. Hello? Oh, hello. You must be the Honey Man. Hi, how are you? I'm Andrew Corey. Andy lives in New Zealand, but travels back and forth to Niue. He runs the local honey industry with help from Arpi. I've heard that you've got these amazing bees. Yeah, we feel we got very lucky to have got the stock we've got up here. So we've been up here 16 years looking after these ones, and um, we think that's pretty special. So if you want to hop in the truck, yeah, you're more than absolutely, welcome. Absolutely. So I think you're going to put your bike over there. Here's some overalls, you need these. That's awesome. Put your bike up <laughs> and, against And them. get in the back as well, is that right? Absolutely, <laughs> ARP, on the back, ARP. Is this Gee. truck safe? <laughs> <laughs> It takes around an hour to drive around Niue and we're headed to one of the furthest parts of this island nation, the jungle. It was back in 1999 when Andy first hacked his way through these mahogany trees. He'd seen a for sale ad in a beekeeping magazine for a honey company abandoned here in the 60s. 
I think everybody, when they get to 40, wants an adventure. I just um, come out of a, a seven-year engagement with a girl, and I, I had nothing to lose. This was his first trip overseas, and Andy had stumbled upon a gold mine beyond his wildest imagination. I'd open them up and have a look, and they were beautiful bees. They were going fine. They were cranking. So I knew this is going, there's never going to be another opportunity like this in the world, and I had to take it. With financial backing from home, Andy got the company up to commercial standard. On paper, we own all the bees on the island. We bought the honey industry off the government. Everything in the jungle is ours. Every year we have uh, the, the Bee Certifying Authority come up from New Zealand and pass us so we can export honey. And he tells us these are the cleanest, best bees in the world. Today, there are 30 hive sites like this one. Local farmers rent Andy their land and earn money from the honey. Finally, I get to see what makes the 30 million bees on this island so special. Time to kit up. I'm a little scared. South Pacific bees have a reputation for their aggression. In um, Fiji, they've got the British bee, which is a horrible little bee like this. And then and you get into Samoa and they've got the German bee, which is just ferocious. And bees on other parts in the Pacific, we wouldn't be kidding up here inside of the hive. We'd be kidding up out the, way up out the car. They're just at you. But these are very calm bees. I could virtually work this hive without a veil on, you know what I mean? So I'll take my veil off to show you that. That's okay. okay. You're not so, afraid at all. Well, you're in the middle of a bee yard and we're not getting pounded, so hopefully I'll be able to crack this one out without getting a nip, eh? Okay. I think Andy I'm says the bees on Nui are mate. easy to handle. Yeah, Amazing. see how calm they are. See, put them right up your face. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Nothing to worry about, mate. Even with a mask on. Oh, yeah, that's nothing crazy. To they look good, eh, Happy? Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Even a scaredy cat like me can hold them. Now, don't drop it, otherwise we're all heading for Texas, OK? <laughs> Go on, do I really don't. No, feel no, you'll good be cool, man. This. You'll be cool. I wouldn't put you. No cool. pesticides or chemicals are used on the hives, so the honey is organic. Just dig in. Just dig in, buddy. Mm. So very good. Very good. Okay. Yeah. And better still, Andy's bees are free of all the mites, parasites, and bugs, which are killing bees around the rest of the world. He thinks one day they could help save global food production by restocking nations facing colony collapse disorder. These are the last Italian stock of any scale that are disease-free, mite-free. We're it. This is it. This is the last place left. It was around the time Andy found hives on Nui that a raft of problems began plaguing the world's bees, including back in New Zealand. One of the worst of those problems, a lethal parasite called the varroa mite. At a university on the south coast, Peter Dearden studies bee genetics. He's showing me an infected hive. Feeding on the bee's blood, they jump from hive to hive and across species. It's been present for quite some time in, uh, in Europe and in uh, Asia and in, um, and in the Americas. In New Zealand, it only arrived on our shores in, a, in about the year 2000, 2001, and it spread down the country. And as they've come down, we can see colonies collapsing. So there can be 35,000 bees in a, in a really good beehive, and yet only a couple of thousand mites, maybe even, even just 2,000 mites getting into that, that hive can cause it to collapse. Peter compares Varroa to the Black Plague. It's like a d dirty hypodermic needle, that's, that's what the problem is. It's carrying viruses and every time it pokes its needle uh, like mouth parts into a bee, it's transmitting those viruses. It, it's a, it, does, when you look at a bee and you see a mite attached to its abdomen um, being carried backwards and forwards, uh, it, you know it's got to be affecting the bee, and it's got to be affecting the bee's performance. Even though these mites can be killed with chemicals, they leave deadly diseases behind in the hives. They've killed all of New Zealand's wild bees, leaving behind domestic bees dependent on human protection. The golden question is, do you think in some ways the mite is, I mean, causing colony collapse disorder and bee losses? The, the presence of the mite is associated with colony collapse disorder. So I think the mites definitely are a contributing factor. I also think that they are the thing we can aim at, right? Viruses in, in insects are just so hard to, to deal with and so hard to do anything about. 
But these mites, if we can find effective ways to kill them and effective ways to, to knock down their populations, I think that will probably be the biggest impact on um, solving the problem of colony collapse disorder. But experts say industrial agriculture could be as much to blame as mites. Original forests are now fields, so bees need to venture further to pollinate and fulfil their nutritional needs. Meanwhile, chemical sprays banned in Europe because of fears they affect bees are still used here. It's a trade-off. We can't have modern agriculture the way it is without insecticides, and we can't have modern agriculture the way it is without insects. There have been lots of reasons proposed, lots of single factors or lots of combinations of factors, and none of them seem to explain all colony collapse all the time. It's a, we need more research, but in some respects it may be a very difficult problem because it may be combinations of these factors all working together, all of them having a little effect, and those little effects building up to a massive effect in colony collapse. And there's even more problems facing the bees, including the skyrocketing price for New Zealand's Manuka honey. That they see the high prices of manuka and they think it's a gold rush and it's attracting a lot of people who are just interested in the money and not in the bees and they come up here and they overstock the areas you're only supposed to have a few hives per square kilometer when you bring in more the bees are going stripping the area of the nectar and also the bees can pick up diseases from from different flowers that other diseased bees have um, visited and it's not just honey bringing in the money Beekeepers are also paid to pollinate orchards and farms. Hives are carted on trucks across the country for hours on end, putting added pressure on bees. They've just really become like cheap migrant workers and they just flog them too hard. The value of the hive has got to, in people's mind, has got to increase. They, they, people just don't respect them and uh, don't value them or anything like that. They are unique, they're an asset, they're a wonderful thing. Whereas now, they just, at the moment in America, and we're suffering the worst losses, they're just a commodity. I can't believe it's there. Back on UA, Andy Corey wants to combat the problems faced by bees by building a Pacific bee sanctuary. To fund that dream, he's producing a range of honey products. Richard Duncan, a managing director of a honey company in New Zealand, is helping him. Yeah, we like to think that what we're doing here is an insurance policy. In 10 years' time, we'd like to see the bees from New Way be spread throughout the Pacific Islands. Along with that, we'd like to see these bees certified and able to be taken to other countries to help augment uh, um, the, the falling bee stock. And what about the difference in... Richard you know, spends a lot of time on New Way too, but he's still learning about bees. So what's with the colour? Is it, does it matter to the bees? That, oh, what, what uh, no, the, that's orientation. That's why they're all okay. painted different colours. The bees can pick up the, the orientation of the colours. But, um, so I here, thought bees were colour blind. No, no. Okay. <laughs> One of those urban myths. Brings on and Richard really handles anything that involves a pen. Okay? Once he gets that level, that's his department, if you can imagine. I'm out in the bees every day looking after bees. He's on the internet. worthy of a picture postcard, but it doesn't exactly buzz with industry. You can pass through villages without seeing a soul. Many houses lie abandoned because most New Ayans have migrated overseas for work. Andy and Richard see their project as not only saving the bees, but also this tiny nation. Well, it's at, yes, it is at a crossroads because no one knows where New Ayan is. You know, New Ayan got under my skin. I think my greatest motivation in many ways is just to see something done for New Way in the New Way, something that they can be proud of, something that they can be part of, something that gives them a, a significant role in the region. Uh, that's, that's kind of the thing that really drives me. Pacific nations struggle to make money from agriculture because of small workforces, limited land, and long shipping routes. But New Way's leader, Premier Toke Talagi, seems keen to take up Andy and Richard's idea. I think at the present moment, we, we're talking to them about the possibilities of becoming joint venture partners. 
The big challenge for his small government is improving biosecurity on this island to keep pests and chemicals out. The fact is we're isolated and we can use that as a basis for ensuring that we don't get contaminants into the bees. Isolation in that sense is a good thing. Just crank. Back in the jungle, Andy's hives are oozing with honey. I know that sound up in his Oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> Holy moly, Abby. Yeah. When it's time for the honey to come in, you can't stop him. Can't stop. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Overflow, Abby. The jug's boiling. <laughs> it's not just isolation that makes Niue a beekeeper's dream. Look at that. Look at that, Arpy. Wow, 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 wow. Ooh. This island nation has a perfect climate to breed queens and keep hives productive all year. In New Zealand, you get a very defined season of probably about four months since you can requeen and raise queens and everything like that. Up here, because there's a pollen source coming in all the time, there's drones all the time, you can make queens all year round. But you've got to get the right size island. If you go too small, um, you know, you can't get the scale up. If you go too big, it's too hard to manage with the, the transport and everything. This is the perfect size island for this project. But Richard acknowledges their project needs scientific support to evaluate the genetic value of New Way's bees and to set up a research station here. Shifting and moving genetic material of bees and particularly live bees around the world is is a very sensitive, and for, for good reason, a very sensitive issue between countries. You can't just shift bees around the world without a, a lot of certification, require a lot of research done, uh, and that's something that hasn't happened in Niue yet. However, the Niue project is getting mixed reaction from bee experts back in New Zealand. A bee sanctuary like that, as a concept, can help us in understanding the issues because you've got bees that are, have been separated from whatever your problem is and you can bring them in and test them. I would consider taking bees from New Way um, once we've done the research, see what we can do with them, but definitely I'd put my hand up and be very interested in the research. Okay. But Peter did and is sceptical. Given their purity, he says New Way's bees could die easily if they're exported overseas and exposed to mites. So, we also know that there's a lot of diversity in bees and that diversity might hold the, the keys to solving the problems of varroa mite and, and, and insecticides because of the, of the genetic diversity. We need to maintain all of that genetic diversity. And just sort of saying, well, we'll just plonk everything in new way because that's a kind of backup isn't, isn't really going to solve that problem. And there's another concern. What worries me about the Niue situation is uh, we already know that Niue is susceptible to cyclones, which is a risk if you're going to bet all your bees in that, in that particular place. Back in 2004, a cyclone did hit Niue, but Andy and the bees are tough. His hives were reduced to cupfuls of bees, which he kept alive with bags of sugar. We knew we were in for a hiding. Oh, all the hives were smashed down, all these trees had fallen down on the hives like that so you couldn't see them from the road. So there was no food for them for a year. There wasn't a, a leaf left on the jungle, it was just like a, uh, a forest of power poles. The bees and forest are now back. Andy hopes to safeguard his stock from future catastrophes by increasing the number of hives fourfold. And for the sanctuary to work, they want to build a second site on Tonga, or another Pacific island. We've got sugar in the shed ready to go for the cyclone if it happens, and um, the hives are a lot stronger and a lot better, so we think we can restand it better this time. We know what we're doing this time. When Andy first embarked on the project, most of Niue thought he was mad. But with the world's bees disappearing, they're slowly warming to his vision. Whether the world follows suit doesn't bother Andy. He'll be working on the hives, hoping for another successful season. I think with the scientific negativity you're getting back in New Zealand from the thing, 
I think it concerns them that this asset's in private hands. It'll be desperation. It'll be desperation that they want one. You know, we're not pushing them down their throat. They will come to us. We don't need to sell them. You've got 20 million people to feed and all your bees are dying. You come and talk to Andy. <laughs> On an island nation few have heard of, Andy is an unlikely saviour. But Niue is raising awareness about the need to save the world's bees. And this valuable insect needs all the help it can get, even from a speck in the ocean.